Welcome to Center for Brains, Minds and Machines. I'm Andy Van Bersky and I'm a postdoc at the center. And I'm joined here today by Michael Douglas. Michael is a professor and a founding member of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics at Stony Brook, also a researcher at Renaissance Technologies and a previous director of the new High Energy Theory Center at Rutgers. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Michael, I understand that your main work is in string theory. And let's start from the deep end. I understand that you have actually previously applied computational complexity theory to understanding st string landscapes. Could you say something about that? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, there's, <clears throat> you know, again, a long, very long story of uh, string theory. One of the uh, central goals is this is supposed to be the theory that describes uh, all of the fundamental laws of physics that we could derive the uh, standard model, the uh, force of gravity, the uh, quarks and leptons, all from uh, string theory. Now, as, as many of you, you might have heard, it's not as easy as that. And the situation is perhaps best described by an analogy. So the problem we have is we, we understand string theory moderately well, but string theory predicts that there are extra dimensions. So six, in some descriptions, seven extra dimensions. And we don't know their structure, their topology, their geometry, very much about them. And we have to work backwards you know, from what we see, what extra dimensions could give rise to that. And uh, the analogy would be, suppose you were a, a chemist and somebody told you, here is the law of all of chemistry, the Schrodinger equation. And they would be right. That's the law of all of chemistry. You can derive all of chemistry from it. But it's a vast project because there are millions or even billions of different molecules and sorting all that out and trying to decide which ones that we see, which substances. Of course, we don't even see molecules. You know, there's several layers of indirection there correspond to which solutions of that equation is quite challenging. And that's a case where we can do the experiments and make all these molecules. So it's all the more challenging given that of the many possibilities string theory describes, we only see our universe. We have no direct evidence for other universes. And so being such a you know, huge, uh, vast problem, one tries to simplify it. And uh, I initiated an approach of which would, would sound uh, you know, very you know, obvious and simple to perhaps a computer scientist, you know, perhaps a you know, neuroscientist. Let's just study the statistics of the solutions. You know, you know, how many have this property? How many have that property? Maybe if more solutions have property A or predict that we'll see a certain particle, then the number of solutions that predict that we won't see that particle, we can base a prediction on that. And uh, that, uh, again, I've, I've, in my collaborators have made a, a lot of mileage with that idea. A lot of other physicists really hate the idea and think that you know, the laws of physics should uniquely determine the laws we see. We, we don't know. So, so now, within that context, we can ask, OK, suppose, suppose we knew something about these statistics. OK, well, you know, we have some evidence that, that yes, you know, the kind of universe that we see is you know, this likely. It's just this kind of general universe. Now, how hard would it be to actually find a solution, a structure for the uh, extra dimensions that uh, realizes that possibility? And the most basic example of that is that we know that the vacuum has uh, energy, the so-called dark energy. It's very, very tiny, but non-zero. Can we find a vacuum, a solution for the extra dimensions, which at least reproduces that one number, this tiny vacuum energy. And what I was able to show in 2006 in uh, work with uh, Frederick Deneff from Columbia is that uh, in models very similar to string theory, and in fact, the string theory case is more complicated, it would be, it's an NP-hard problem to uh, find such a uh, vacuum. So we could be in this paradoxical situation that we have Good evidence, yes, string theory describes our universe, but we cannot actually find the solution of string theory that describes our universe. So. Wow, that's very interesting. So now that you've kind of gone on this uh, explanation, maybe you can kind of step back historically, and I would like to understand um, where did your interest in computer science kind of come, come in? I understand okay. that you worked on this thing called the digital artery right. when you were in Caltech. Can you say something about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had been really equally interested in uh, 
fundamental physics and uh, you know computer science and AI since I was in uh, high school. You know, I, I, I avidly. I mean, of course, you know something like a uh, go to lecture Bach, but you know, you know, you know Minsky's books. You know, and you know, you know, I, I heard of Jerry Sussman even even back then, and. Uh, so uh, you know, in, 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 in some ways, it's not it's not quite an accident that I wound up doing string theory. But when I chose where to go to grad school, I went to Caltech. I had never heard of string theory, and uh, I went there because they had both. They had uh, you know very strong uh, particle physics, fundamental physics, but they also had very strong uh, neuroscience and this very strong tradition of interdisciplinary work. As you know, Caltech's a little place, and so mm -hmm. everybody can meet everybody. And in particular, I, I, I visited before uh, you know, deciding where to go. And I went to a, a course, and this was a very seminal course in the history of certainly the relations between physics and computation and even computer science. It was, it was co-taught by uh, Richard Feynman, you know, the famous physicist, John Hopfield, a, a famous uh, chemical biophysicist, and uh, Carver Mead, a uh, computer scientist, one of the you know, pioneers of the VLSI design. And uh, they were exploring this uh, questions, what are the relations between uh, physics and uh, computer science? And I, you know, I, I was fascinated. You know, I decided to go to Caltech. The, each of them gave their own course. They, they had so much to say you know, that the one course split into three. And Feynman gave the first lectures about quantum computing. Carver Mead gave lectures about what we now call neuromorphic computing. They were inventing those ideas. And, and John Hopfield had uh, what many of people will have heard of, especially here, the uh, Hopfield model, something which was directly inspired by uh, physics and statistical mechanics, the uh, spin glass, but was applied to produce a, a model of uh, memory and something that one could analyze using uh, physics techniques. And that, 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 that same year, Jerry Sussman was coming on a sabbatical from uh, MIT. He spent a year at Caltech to work with uh, people like uh, Peter Goldreich on uh, planetary dynamics and to uh, build a computer, the digital orrery, with which uh, we showed that uh, the motion of uh, Pluto in the solar system is chaotic. So it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was quite an incredible year, but at the end of it, for, for whatever reason, I, 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 I had spent a lot of time you know, learning neural networks in Hopfield, and I told myself, well, this is very cool stuff, but, but it, it, somehow it's going to take a while to actually get anywhere. I'm not quite yeah. sure what reasoning I, I applied to, to do that. But in any case, that was my attitude. And then I came back in the fall of 1984. And uh, those of you who have you know, know something, you know, the history of string theory, this was the year of the uh, Green Schwartz anomaly cancellation, this revolutionary discovery that uh, started the modern era of string theory. And the, uh, most of the students in particle physics, theoretical physics of Caltech switched to work on string theory, as did I. But uh, so, so, so indeed, that led to a, a lot of exciting things, you know, the, the, the sort of work I just described. But I, I kept up my interest in uh, AI, computer science, uh, branching out in many directions. You know, there's a lot of very interesting interactions between uh, physics and uh, you know, machine learning, statistics, uh, statistical physics, and uh, in part leading to the uh, topic that I'll uh, discuss in my uh, seminar uh, later today, the uh, applications of uh, AI, uh, new computational technologies to help us do research in mathematics and physics. Uh, before we get into that, I would like to ask you about something because you've been very involved with the IHGS in France, and I was just curious how exactly that came about. Okay, oh, very good. So this is a, a famous institute in the world, especially of mathematics and uh, theoretical physics. They have a little bit of uh, biology. So far, not so much uh, neuroscience or cognitive psychology, but uh, in any case, it was started in the uh, 50s and modeled after the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Princeton, and uh, has had more Fields medalists associated with it than any other institution, university, whatever. So, so in, in, in math terms, this is, this is the center of the universe. And uh, so my, my own uh, relation to it uh, essentially starts uh, in uh, 1997, because uh, I had met a, a very active uh, professor named uh, Alain Kahn, who uh, was a, both in College of France and IHES, and was, he, he developed a subject called non-commutative geometry, okay, which, uh, again, is going kind of far afield. But 
you know, he, thought, he felt it had applications to physics, and he even had a way to derive the standard model from it. And in fact, most physicists, I'm, 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 I'm sad to say, didn't, did not think very much of his work. But uh, for a variety of reasons, I, it, I, was, I was more sympathetic, and there were various discoveries, something called the Dirichlet brain, again, a very long story, that you could see the connection. In fact, uh, Edward Witten had pointed this out. I was, in a way, following this lead, that uh, according to the equations of the Dirichlet brain, a coordinate on space that describes where you are actually becomes a matrix, you know, so it's non-commutative when you multiply matrices. So what could be more like non-commutative geometry than that? So, so if one stood back, you know, that, that was already enough reason to be interested in talking to Alan Kahn. And so they actually, uh, I think on the strength of that, offered me a job there. And uh, so I, I, I went. There were, you know, again, long story, you know, personal family reasons that, that led me there, and that in, in the end I didn't take the permanent job. But I kept up a, a long association with the IHES. There was a period of 10 years during which I would spend every summer there. I, in fact, uh, talked quite a bit with uh, Maxim Konsevich, a mathematician who's the only person to win two of the uh, breakthrough prizes the, in both uh, mathematics and uh, physics. And, and his, his insights were very central in, in some of the work I did after that. Uh, in more recent years, I've uh, been involved in uh, quantitative finance, and I've been, uh, in fact, uh, heading their fundraising organization in the uh, United States, a group called uh, Friends of IHES. Mm. And uh, so we uh, you know, ra ra raise money to support scientific research. We provide a way for U.S. Uh, citizens or you know, U U.S. people to give a tax-deductible donation. So if you are looking for a worthy uh, scientific institute to give to out there, this is uh, one to keep in mind. And we have uh, public events to, uh, you know, convey you know, some of the, the, the great work that goes on in the IHS to an American audience. So maybe to cap off, uh, do you think that current AI can be used to do math, or do we need to go beyond it? OK, so uh, I, I think already the current AI can be very useful for, for mathematicians, for physicists, and uh, that, that will be the body of my talk, but it will not enable computers to do math, to discover theorems, to create on their own. And in fact, I make a prediction of, of, of this sort at the end of my talk. So my, my talk is entitled, How Will We Do Mathematics in 2030? And I do not think computers will achieve a human or even a creative level of mathematics. But my prediction is that uh, Right at present, you can even, it, 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 it's hard to, de to defend the, the claim that computers are doing creative thought and understanding complex questions in, in any domain. But uh, math will not be the first, okay? So, but once we see that computers can, if not do creative thought, at least access facts from a large database and do logical reasoning on those facts in a robust way, 10 years from then computers will start to do what we could call human level math. Thank you, Michael, for this illuminating conversation. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk later this afternoon. And thank you for joining us. If you're interested in more content like this, you can find it on the CBMM website.